Good morning and welcome to Chattanooga Valley Presbyterian Church on this uh, fifth Sunday of August. I am glad you're with us this morning, whether you're here in the sanctuary, downstairs in our overflow room, or joining us over the internet. Um, welcome. This is the day the Lord has made. Um, I uh, just, qu- as a quick reminder, you know, things are a little bit different uh, in terms of the order of our service and some of the logistics. We don't have fellowship paths, um, so I would point you to the back of your bulletin for the uh, QR code, or you can go to our website, uh, chatvalleypca.com. You can fill out a connect card, let us know that you visited with us, or that you'd like to talk to an elder or deacon, or you have uh, any prayer requests. Um, There's also links there for um, uh, online giving as well. Um, As we uh, prepare for worship this morning, I will read the meditation found on the first page of your bulletin from 2 Corinthians. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let us meditate on the word of the Lord as he prepares our hearts for worship this morning. before the Lord our God and come before him to worship him in spirit and in truth. Hear now the words of God. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the, of, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my strength, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at the noonday. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let's sing, O God, our help in ages past.
is our help in ages past. What a wonderful hymn of reminder for us that the same God that helped our spiritual forefathers is the same God now that will help us. At this time, I'll ask Elder Albert Levingood to come and lead us in our pastoral prayer. Let us pray. Father, Lord of heaven and earth, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. O oh Lord, as we enter into this time of worship, we give you praise. Lord, we give you praise for you have ordained one in seven for us to rest in you. Lord, we pray that you would help us to strive in entering in this Sabbath day of rest. Oh, Father, we give you praise for you, the all-knowing God. You know us. You've called us by name. Oh, Lord, we give you praise for you are the ever-present God, and we thank you for being with us. We thank you that you will never leave or forsake us. To the all-powerful God who created us and ordains every one of our days, we give blessing and honor and glory and power to our God forever and ever. O oh Lord, we confess that we often struggle to rest in your goodness. For my heart is easily overwhelmed and distracted by the unknown and the lack of control that I often feel. O oh Lord, in our weakness, we come before the throne of grace, knowing that your spirit helps us in our weakness. Your spirit intercedes on our behalf with groanings too deep for words. Lord, as we come into worship this morning, we groan on behalf of uh, this congregation, this community, our nation, and the world. Lord, um, we think of the past couple of weeks, uh, the returning to school uh, amidst the pandemic. And Lord, we pray for our teachers and the administrators. Lord, we, get, we pray that you would give them strength and wisdom and courage as they shepherd our children. Lord, we uh, pray uh, that you would give them patience as they deal with frequent schedule changes and um, additional policies to administer. Lord, protect them from sickness, protect them from discouragement, and even as you've ordained times of, of weeping and mourning and uh, times of, of frustration, Lord, would you please give times of joy and rejoicing, even laughter. Lord, we pray for the parents. We pray for parents who are navigating um, in school uh, sessions as well as um, online sessions and uh, just all the different dynamics and rules that uh, we need to follow. Lord, protect uh, our parents from fear, uh, from anxiety, uh, as our children uh, go back to school. Lord, uh, give us parents patience uh, uh, and long-suffering and, and um, just the ability to support and encourage the teachers and administrators. And Lord, we also pray for our students. Um, Lord, what an amazing time. Uh, to learn about our creator and how he has structured the world. And Lord, we pray that these things would not be a distraction. Um, Lord, we thank you for uh, protecting them this far and, and uh, may we continue to participate in, in school. 
And Lord, we think of the healthcare workers on the front line, um, delivering care every day. Uh, protect them, uh, give them strength. Uh, Lord, many are working long hours, and um, Lord, we pray that you would uh, lift them up and encourage them. Lord, we also uh, mourn with those who mourn. Uh, Lord, those who have lost loved ones either recently or uh, over the past year or even longer. Lord, be with them, encourage them, strengthen them according to your word. Lord, we continue to lift up the Monahans. Uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, just so many ways in which we see your goodness and your grace and your strength and your mercy in their lives. And so, Lord, we continue to uh, heal, uh, that you would heal Dana's body. Um, and so, Lord, that you would also protect his heart and his mind. Uh, may he delight in you and in you alone. And we pray that as well uh, for the Monahans. Lord, we love you. And we long uh, to see your churches full. To see uh, all those that you have called by your name, uh, worshiping and singing uh, and declaring the goodness of our Heavenly Father. And so, Lord, as we go enter into this time of worship, we pray that you would strengthen us uh, to do just that. Whether we are uh, in the overflow room or in the sanctuary or online, uh, would you stir in our hearts um, a peace that surpasses all understanding And Lord, help us to pray uh, as you have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you would, uh, please turn in your bulletins to the second page, and we have a time of confession this morning, reading responsively uh, chapter 2 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, which begs the most important theological question of all, who is God? Uh, our answer to who God is determines all of our thinking. And while the vocabulary uh, there in the confession of faith may be difficult for us in the 21st century, um, it's impossible for us to just dismiss it as some sort of a dry academic point of doctrine that's peripheral uh, to our Christian living. But in fact, the doctrine of God is the life of the Christian. Uh, we can't profess to have eternal life if we don't uh, know God and who he is. And it's also vital for the proclamation and worship uh, for us as a church, because if we're wrong on this point, then uh, we're wrong on everything. And if our theology doesn't issue itself in adoration and praise, uh, then something's wrong. So let us read responsively the words that the divines of Westminster gave an expression to, these thoughts that called forth to them their greatest praises of their hearts. Um, I will read, uh, we will read, I will read L, and we will all read the bold. Christian, there is but one only living and true God who is infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will, for his own glory, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. The rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and withal most just, and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. God hath all life, glory, 
goodness, blessedness in and of himself, and is alone in and unto himself all sufficient, not standing in need of any creatures which he hath made, not deriving any glory from them, but only manifesting his own glory in, by, unto, and upon them. He is the alone fountain of all being, of whom, through whom, and to whom are all things, and hath most sovereign dominion over them, to do by them, for them, or upon them, whatsoever himself self pleaseth. In his sight all things are open and manifest. His knowledge is infinite, infallible, and independent upon the creature, so as nothing is to him contingent or uncertain. He is most holy in all his counsels, in all his works, in all his commands. To him is due from angels and men and every other creature whatsoever worship, service, or obedience he is pleased to require of them. In the unity of the Godhead, there be three persons of one substance, power, and eternity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, the Holy Ghost eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. Amen. May the Lord help us to capture that vision that, of what we've confessed to serve the Lord with all our hearts and our minds. And so now please stand and join our voices by singing my prayer as we prepare for the preaching and teaching of God's word.
you will, please take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 139. We've been in Psalm 139 for a little bit. This is our final Sunday in Psalm 139 as we conclude, at least for this year, our Summer in the Psalm series. Um, it would be kind of awkward to continue the Summer in the Psalm series in the fall. Um, I don't know what we'd call it then, like Summer in the, uh, you know, Psalms in the fall it doesn't have a, a rhythm to it or a rhyme. Um, and so, uh, but that's not the reason why I ended, uh, the, I'm ending the Summer in the Psalm series for continuity purposes. But I wanted to take up uh, a series, and I'll start this next week, the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus. Um, and one of the reasons why I, I think it would be helpful for us to study the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus is because it's always struck me that if Jesus needed the power of the Holy Spirit on his life, how much more do we? And how much more do we think about how the Holy Spirit impacts our life and our heart and how he works through us to do the work of the ministry? We can do the work of the Christian life or ministry in the flesh, but the Bible tells us very, uh, very plainly what the works of the flesh produce. And so we don't want to do that. We want to produce or evidence the fruit of the Spirit. And I thought uh, looking at the life of Jesus would be so helpful for us as a people. Uh, today is also the fifth Sunday, um, so, you know, it's an extra holy day, if you would look at it, and, I, you know, another time to get that fifth Sunday in there. Um, you know, Scott and I had decided to wear bow ties uh, today, but then uh, Scott uh, remembered and I didn't. So maybe I can go on record to say that the next fifth Sunday, if you have a bow tie, we can all wear it. And like come to church, uh, you know, if you don't, it's fine. Like, you're not going to get excommunicated for it. Um, but it would be, it'd be just something to, to draw attention to, I don't know, the fifth Sunday. And I, I always think that's, that's good for a church to, to mark events like that. But anyway, I'm just rambling now. But, uh, but so I, I went on record. If you have a bow tie, the next fifth Sunday, wear one. And, um, and we can all like be true Southerners at that point. Um, let's look at Psalm 139. We'll be reading verses 13 down to verse number 24 as we end our summer in the Psalm series. Hear now the word of the Lord. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. O oh, men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies." Now look at verse 23, uh, 23 and 24, because 23 and 24 is the culmination of God's, uh, um, God's attributes, his, his omniscience, his omnipresence, his omnipotence, the culmination of, um, of that in the life of the believer. What is the purpose of those things being manifested to us? Verse 23 and 24 tells us, here now, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. All flesh is as grass and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord shall endure forever. And this is the word that would be preached unto you. Amen and amen. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy that is poured out every day on your people. 
Father, now please um, help us. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Stir and work in our hearts that we might have faith and complete trust in you. Father, help us to be not just hearers of the word, but doers as well. That we might walk out of this sanctuary with renewed hearts and renewed minds. Give us wisdom that only you can give. And bless us now, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Um, We're going to be looking at the last section in this psalm. And if you look uh, up to this point in the psalm, we've looked at God's omniscience, that's verse 1 through 6, in which we talked about how it is that God knows everything there is to know. And we talked about the fact that it just doesn't mean that no one can beat God at jeopardy. It, it means something more complete than that, that God knows us intimately. There's an intimate aspect to that as well. And then from verse 7 through 12, we looked at God's omnipresence, the fact that the ever-present God is always with us, and His Spirit is there to watch over us, and His Spirit is there to guide us in the direction that we need to go and how we need to cultivate an awareness of His presence. And today we're going to be looking and seeing how from God's omnipresence, David leads us into this reality of God's omnipotence. And when we think of um, the the word omnipotent or or the fact that God is omnipotent, a lot of people misunderstand that. I I had one person ask me one time, who was an unbeliever, um, said, hey Dennis, does, does God omnipotence mean that it's possible for him to create a rock too big for him to lift. And you know, that's, that's typical misunderstanding of what it means for God to be powerful or for God to be strong or God um, to, to be able to do all his holy will. And I simply told him that, no, that's not what omnipotence means. Omnipotence simply means that God can do all his holy will. Whatever it is that God sets out to do, he has the power to do. If he created us, he, had the, he has the power to do those things in which he has willed for us to do. So, of course, God cannot create a rock too big for him to lift. There's a whole bunch of things that God cannot do. He cannot lie. He cannot act um, in accordance, uh, and do things that are opposite his will. And it's certainly the case that God cannot act in, a logical, in an illogical way. So that's what we mean when we talk about God's omnipotence. And look and see how David fleshes that out. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to look and see how David fleshes out this concept of God's omnipotence. And I want you to look at three truths and how they apply to our life. This, this doctrine to me, you know, not to pit God's attributes against each other, but if I were to pick an attribute of God that seems to be most real in my life, it's this, it's this attribute, the omnipotence of God. And we're going to look at that, and we're going to see how that applies to our life. So here are the three truths that we're going to look at. First of all, God is powerful yet personal. That's verse 13, 15, and 16. Then we're going to look at the fact that God's power is worthy of praise. That's verse number 14, where David says, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And then we're going to look at the purpose of God's power, and that's verse 23 and 24. So first of all, God is powerful yet personal. God's power is worthy of praise, and then the purpose of God's power. Let's begin with God is powerful, yet personal. Look at verse number 13. David says this, For you formed my inward parts, and you knitted me together in my mother's womb. And then if you go down to verse 15 and 16, David talks about how, uh, David says, My frame was not hidden from you, Lord, when I was made in secretly, secret and intricately woven in the depths of the earth. And when you look at these verses, you think to yourself, at least it is the case, that when we think about power, when you and I think about power, when we think about the exercise of power, we often think that the exercise of power is a show of force on something in a big and mighty way. So especially when we think about God's omnipotence, we think of God's ability to make mountains and to make vast seas and to make the expanse in the sky that's ever expanding, right? That's how we think of God's power. 
But David approaches God's power in a different way. He says God's power is manifested in the fact that he formed a tiny baby in the womb. That that the culmination of God's power is the fact that he can knit together a baby in his mother's womb. Like this, this is a sign of God's power that, that the intricacies of the human body, the, the word in fact for inward parts is actually the word that's typically used for kidneys, that, that God is so powerful that he's able to produce a tiny kidney in the womb. Think about that. Tiny lungs, tiny hearts, that, that every aspect of the human body, if you were to look at it and tear it apart, you'll see how intricate it is. David is saying, this is a sign of God's power. But at the same time, David is saying, this is the sign of how God is so personal with us. Think about that for a moment. Think about the way and consider for a moment the way in which God's power is revealed in the formation of a child, but how it also indicates the personal relationship God desires to have with us. Think about the creation of Adam above all of God's creation. The Bible says that God formed Adam out of the, out of the dust, out of the clay of the ground. And after he formed Adam, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became this, this living soul, an embodied being. And, and why did God do that? To, to create a relationship with Adam. And then when it came to creating woman, the Bible says that he put Adam to sleep and then he he slit his wrist. I don't know how God did it anyway. I was like, man, how did he do it? Did he have like a holy scalpel that he used? Like how did, you know, how did he manage it? I don't know, but but the Bible says it. I believe it. It's true. And and so he takes a rib out of Adam and, and then he brings um, Eve to Adam, and Adam is like, whoa, this is the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And, and keep in mind, it's the only woman he's ever seen, but that's, you know, that's besides the point. That was good for her to hear, right? And, and the formation of Eve, that, that, that's a son of God's power, but notice how he puts them into covenant with each other to indicate the personal relationship they were supposed to have. And then think about every successive human being that was born into the world, that how they were, they were meant to be born in the covenant relationship of marriage in which man and woman, they, they have this child and God created this, this womb inside the woman and, and even though the womb belongs to her, the, the womb is actually made for, for someone else, a baby. And that baby forms in the womb. And there's this intimate relationship in that forming between, between mother and baby. And, and, and that relationship continues for nine months. And then the baby is born into a covenant home. And, and, and then there's this series of time where the baby is completely helpless. You know, the scientist says it's like from first... From, from one year old to, to, I think, up to four. Some of you might think it's 18, but that's, you know, that's beside the point. But, but, but there, it's the case that there are all these covenant relationships that are formed through birthing. And I think that David uses this example to indicate that God is so powerful, yet he's so personal. Because he wants us to know that God's power is not in conflict with his, with his personal desire for us to be in union and communion with him. And then notice how David takes it up a notch, right? He takes it up a notch. Notice with me in verse number 15 and 16, David says, not only does God personally form us, and this is a sign of his power and a sign of his personal connection with us, but David says, even, even when his frame was hidden, it was not hidden from God that he was intricately woven in the depths of the earth. And then in verse number 16, he says, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In other words, he said, God, you knew me even before I was a baby. And furthermore, he says, God, you have, in your book, you have written and formed all my days. Now, scholars don't know if all his days mean the nine months that he was being born, God had portioned that out, or, or if it's the entirety of his life, but it doesn't matter because David is saying before he was even born, before he was a thought, before his parents even got together, they, God had portioned out his days and God knew him that the power of God was on his life at that time. 
And that's such a remarkable, beautiful, wonderful example of the power of God and how God is personal. And let me say this too. The, these verses are also the reason why, for a Christian, we value life in the womb. This is why, as a Christian, we also value life outside of the womb as well. Hey, listen, I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in making a political statement here. Uh, you know, I think, I think we always get distracted by the politics of our time. I, I, can I just make a gospel statement? Is that okay? I see some heads. Sure. I'll go ahead. God not only cares about life in the womb, and that's precious to him, but God also cares about life outside of the womb, and it's precious to him. And we live in a culture of death in which we're so, we're so disinterested when we see people dying. And we're so fractured in the way we approach it. There's some of us, we care inordinately, inordinately about life in the womb, and we'll, we'll beat that drum. And then there's some of us, we care inordinately about life outside of the womb, and we beat that drum. But notice how David, David is beating both drums at the same time. And it's making some beautiful music. And what David is saying is, God, you care for me in the womb, but you also care for me outside of the womb. And Christian, you should be grieved at the fact that millions and millions of children die in the womb every year through abortion. But we should also be terribly grieved at the fact that many, many young men and young women are senselessly killed in our society. And we should passionately pursue to protect both because that's the gospel imperative that we have a God that's not just interested in making people, but that same God is interested in entering into a personal relationship with others as well. And God is eminently pro-life. And we should be too, but it's all of life. And it's in the way that we pursue all of life. These verses are calling us to something powerfully radical. And that is that we as the church should passionately pursue a culture that promotes life in all of its forms. Because that's what the scripture calls us to. That's what the scripture demands of us. That we enter into this relationship. Notice with me also, not only that God is powerful yet personal, but notice that God's power is worthy to be praised. Look at verse number 14. David says, God, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Now, what is David doing here? Well, well, David, this isn't new to David. David is often praising God for his creation. If you go to Psalm 8, David says the same thing. Lord, I praise you because your glory is revealed. In Psalm 19, David says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament is handiwork. But what David is doing there in Psalm 8 and Psalm 19 is radically different from what David is doing in verse number 14. In Psalm 8 and in Psalm 19, David is praising God because his glory is seen in creation. He's not saying that this is something vastly unique. This is just the handiwork of God. But in verse number 14, the word where he says made or wonderfully made is actually the word meaning set apart. And what David is realizing is that Mankind, each and every one of us as image bearers of God, has been set aside. And David is saying that, that the fact that we are uniquely set apart, that we are uniquely and fearful, fairly, fearfully and wonderfully made, is worthy to be praised. That each one of you is a unique worshiper of God, designed perfectly and beautifully for God's holy ends. Now let me say this. There are many of us that don't fully believe that. And I've met people in my life that don't fully embrace that. You know, I, I worked at a, as a coffee shop. I was a barista. Any baristas in here? Uh, 
It's, you know, there's a cult of baristas. You know, we know, uh, you know, if you've worked in a coffee shop, you always get together and talk shop a little bit. And so I, there was a, a young lady that I knew while I was there, and she would, she would come by and she would get the same thing every day. She would get a sugar-free, non-fat, uh, hot mocha, right? 24-ounce skim milk with four shots of espresso every day. Now, I might not remember, and, and I don't, but I remember a drink, and every day. And, and what, what's so cool about that is once you've memorized a drink, you know, if you saw that car coming, you'd start making it, and then as they come, you just hand it right out the window. It's so cool, you know? You get more tips that way, you know? Forget, <laughs> forget caring for the customer. You're just like, I want the tips. And so, and so every day she would come by, and I noticed every day that she came by, she got skinnier and skinnier. And, you know, that's fine. If you wanted to lose some weight, that's fine. But, but, but then it kept happening. And over the course of months, it got to a point where she became emaciated. I mean, her cheeks were just sucked in. And, and I, you know, I'm not trying to be unkind or false equivalency here, but, but she honestly, she looked like one of the, one of the pictures you saw of a Jew in, in, in a, an Auschwitz or, or, or a Nazi prison camp, right? She just looks, she began to look so frail. And, you know, we had a ministry there. We would, we would talk to our customers and different things like that. But I, but I, I didn't feel comfortable talking to her. So I, I asked um, the, the young lady that worked with me, I said, hey, do you know what's going on with her? Does she have, like, cancer? Or she said, and she's like, no, Dennis, um, she's, she's starving herself because she wants to look like a supermodel. And, and the only sustenance she had in a given day was a sugar-free, non-fat mocha latte, 24-ounce skim milk with four shots of espresso. And in that moment, I thought, man, she would have benefited so, so much from somebody going up there and telling her, you don't have to do this because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And hey, can I tell you that I know exactly what she was thinking because, you know, th there, were, there are times in my life where I often think, man, I really wish I was like this, or I really wish I was this or modeled this, right? Yeah, like all of us go through that struggle of wanting to be someone else or something else instead of appreciating the way God has made us and how he has uniquely designed us to give him the maximum glory. And if we were something else, like something else, taller, shorter, prettier, whatever, we could not give glory to God to the maximum degree as we do right now. And this young lady was hospitalized time and time again and went through therapy and was to the brink of losing her life all because she didn't embrace this glorious truth that each and every one of us are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. And we don't have to strive to look like anyone else or be like anybody else. And what David is praising God for is he realized that he was uniquely set apart by God to be in fellowship and communion with God. And think about this for a moment. Think about how so often we read the Bible and we're disconnected from the God of the Bible, right? And he, let me explain it this way. I, most of you have heard me quote C.S. Lewis. I, I am a big fan of C.S. Lewis. I read all of his works. It's not just because me and him share a last name. Um, he spells it a little differently. It's L-E-W-I-S for him and, and um, L-O-U-I-S for me. And, and I, I'm such a big C.S. Lewis fan that, that I actually tried to name Caden, my son, after C.S. Lewis, right? His, his initials are actually C.S. Lewis, Caden Seth Lewis. And, and I wanted to name him Clive Staples Lewis. And my wife was like, no, I don't like Clive and I don't like Staples. It's not happening. Um, but, but I'm a huge fan of C.S. Lewis. And so when I read C.S. Lewis's works, 
His works are so powerful to me because they help shape my understanding of the gospel and they help me to understand God in this unique way. But, but the thing that frustrates me about reading C.S. Lewis is I, I could never be in relationship with him. There, there's not, it's not the case that I can ever shake C.S. Lewis's hand and I could ever meet him and say, hey, thank you for allowing the Holy Spirit to work through you. To, to impact my life and my thinking. It's not the case that I can give him a hug or commune with him or spend time with him. And so, so often when I read his writings, they're slightly disappointing because I, I can experience the power of his words, but I can't experience the power of his presence here with me. And, and what David is saying here is, is, this is why I think it's so powerful, because David is saying, not only do I know that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, but David is saying, my soul knows it very well. And, and here's what that means. David is saying, not only do I know that as a fact, an intellectual experience, uh, fact, but I also get to experience that in my life. That, that unlike me, when I read C.S. Lewis, I, I, I can read him and I could, I could take that truth and it's a wonderful truth, but I can't experience the person that wrote it. But David is saying, I can actually be in relationship with the person who created me and told me that I am fearfully, wonderfully made. And, and, and then we ask the question, well, why, why is it that we were fearfully and wonderfully made? Well, you and I are fearfully and wonderfully made to give God praise. In fact, isn't that what David is doing right here? He's saying, God, I am praising you. I, I am praising you because I am fearfully, wonderfully made. This is what you and I were created to do. Praise God. And by the way, only you can praise God as you. Hey, listen, I, I love the way... So many of you praise God in this church. I, I mean, I love our elders praise God in a, in a profound way, our deacons. There's so many of you that love God. But, but as, as wonderful as I see some of you worshiping, I can't praise God in the same way that you're praising God, and that gives God maximum glory. No, no, no. I have to praise God as me with all my imperfections. With all my fears and frustrations, I, I have to praise God as me. Because as I praise God, and as I give God glory as a unique worshiper, then I am truly giving God the maximum glory for who I am. And so please, don't, don't spend your time trying to be someone else or trying to fit an ideal. And here's what I have to say too. How often in a church do we put that pressure on each other? to conform to an ideal, to be like someone else. Parents, how often do we do that to our children where we force them to fit an ideal and we don't parent them and love them for how they are? Listen, one of the most destructive things in the church is for us to expect the other person to be this preconceived notion of what we think they should be instead of encouraging them to embrace God as they are. Now, I'm not talking in our sinfulness. So don't hear what I'm not saying, as a close friend of mine would often say. No, I'm not talking about embrace your sinfulness. I'm talking about embracing who God has created you to be and then encouraging one another with our gifts and with our talents to praise and worship the Lord. Notice the final thing as we, as we move on. Not only do we see the fact that God is powerful yet personal, not only do we see that the correct response to God's power is praise and worship, but notice also the purpose of God's power, the purpose of God's power. Now, verse 17 and 18 um, begin sort of like a crescendo, if you will, into this glorious truth that we see, verse 23 and 24. In verse 17 and 18, David is saying, God, how precious are your thoughts. How vast is some of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still there. David is saying, God, I, I don't understand, but you, there are all these thoughts that you have. There's so many of them. They're, they're, I cannot count them. And David is saying, in essence, God, you, you are an amazing God, there are aspects of you that are incomprehensible. 
I don't understand what you're doing in the life of your people, but I know to some degree that your thoughts are upon us. And these are redemptive thoughts. These are thoughts in which we are brought into union and communion with him. I notice that from there, David goes into this discussion of the wicked. And here, I think this fits in from the standpoint that, they, uh, that God knows who the wicked is and therefore is able to uh, punish them because of the fact that they are not living in obedience to God. But, but then verse 23 and 24 happens. And, and here's, here's the trajectory, right? Follow the trajectory. David talks about in verse 1 through 6, God's omniscience. Then he talks about in 7 and 12, God's omnipresence. And then in 13 through 16, he talks about God's omnipotence. And then he flows down into verse 23 and 24 and talks about how all of those attributes of God are brought to bear on our hearts. And what's the purpose of that? Notice at the end of verse 24, so that we might be led in the way of everlasting. The application of God's attributes in our life is so that we can come before God as a unique worshiper and say, Lord, search me and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me. You and I that are in here today, we need these attributes of God as we think about them. We are asking God to do something that only God can do, and that is to search our hearts and minds and reveal the sinfulness in our hearts and ask him to purge those things out. And how does he purge those things out? By, by leading us in the way of everlasting. Now, what does it mean to be led in the way of everlasting? Well, if you, if you read through the Bible, you've read this concept of the way. It, it occurs like over 800 times in the Bible. And it usually has to do with a path that you and I can take from an ethical perspective. So if you go to Psalm 1-6, he says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Or if you go to Psalm 23, it says, We are led down paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So the way ends up becoming an ethical path of faith in which you and I walk down. And so David is saying here, in essence, God, lead me in your way. Only you have the power to transform my heart, mind, and soul to lead me in the way of everlasting. And what does the way of everlasting look like? I love what one commentator says. He says this, the psalmist is leading us to, here's the way of everlasting life. I mean, everlasting, uh, the way everlasting. To commit ourselves to God through pledges and promises. That's a part of being in the way of everlasting. To depend on God through petition and expressions of acceptance. To seek comfort in God through lament and complaint. To find mercy from God through confession and repentance. To gain new wisdom and perspective from God through meditation, remembrance, and reflection. That is the way of everlasting to be led down a path in which we are pursuing God and living up to the things that God would have us to do. This is why when Jesus came, Jesus said what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but through me. The way being mentioned here, why, why now in the New Testament, Jesus becomes our way. Because now it's through, by grace, through faith, as we participate in union and communion with Christ. That it's through that process of daily fellowship with Christ that we are led in the way of everlasting. That we are led in the way of blessing. That's the power of Christ manifested in you and I. And what happens as a result of that? Well, we are able to endure trials. We're able to overcome sin. We are able to express joy in the, midst, in the midst of depression. And we persevere amid discouragement. And we exercise faith in the midst of hopelessness. And we exhibit strength in the midst of weakness. This is what happens when we are led in the way of Christ. This is what happens when you and I rely on the power of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. You are so good to us. We thank you that through your attributes, we see your power and your knowledge and your presence. We learn about these things and how they apply to us in the here and now. Lord, thank you that as the God who knows all things, you know us. 
and as the God who has the power to be everywhere, you are here with us. And as the God who has power, all power, almighty, that you give that power to us to live in freedom and hope in the gospel. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close worship today by singing Faith of Our Fathers. Please stand. that God's people look at their Lord and say, we will be true to thee till death. Lord, please give us the ability to do that. You've heard the gospel today, and I hope the gospel has stirred your hearts to love God even more than you did before, and that you're challenged to live out the implications of your life as a believer. Rest in the comfort of your Lord. Receive now the Lord's benediction to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore, so that all the peoples will say, Amen, our Lord is faithful. Praise the Lord. I will dismiss you by Rose starting in the back.